Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Ken Taylor. I'm the culture producer north for the British Library. Uh, and welcome to uh, our first webinar for the Leeds Digital Festival, A Rethink Research Illuminates History. Um, we're really pleased to be part of the Digital Festival uh, for the second year. And of course, this time uh, we are operating in a, a virtual environment. So we welcome people both in Leeds and, and further afield to this discussion. Um, I'm going to over to you shortly to Dr. Mia Ridge. Uh, Mia is our digital creator for Western Heritage. Uh, and she's also the co-investigator on Living with Machines, uh, which is our, our joint venture project with the Alan Turing Institute and universities that's going to form the focus of what we talk about uh, this afternoon. Uh, there'll be a particular segment of time uh, for questions towards the end, uh, but I will be in the background. Uh, hopefully, if you have any issues, just uh, pop a message in chat and I'll, uh, I'll try and uh, resolve them for you. Um, without further ado then, uh, happy to hand over to Mia uh, to uh, start the uh, more interesting part of our event. Uh, Mia, over to you. Thank you everyone for um, joining us today and I, I hope you're all well and happy. Um, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes and then hopefully there'll be lots of time for questions. I've tried to anticipate common questions as I go, but um, not being able to see the audience makes it um, slightly harder. So um, hopefully Ken can pick up questions and then we'll, anything that's not answered during my talk will pick up at the end. Um, so as Ken said, I'm the digital curator for Western Heritage Collections. Um, I'll talk more about what that means um, and a co-investigator for Living With Machines. Um, a co-investigator is one of those pieces of academic language. Um, in more purely tech talk, it might be something like um, a responsible person or senior stakeholder. Um, I'll be covering a lot of um, uh, different topics across this talk, but also providing a lot of links so that you can find out more um, outside of the talk. So I thought I would explain something about the British Library because not everyone is familiar with our work. Um, talk about how we're responding to changing research practices, particularly changes in the digital environment. Um, explore why we want to collaborate with um, academics and how how it helps us understand the future of research and then go into more detail about a case study with living with machines thinking about how we're combining data science and historical research methods um, and then closing by talking about where you can find out more um, so the british library's mission is for research inspiration and enjoyment um, we're the national library of the uk we are a copyright library which means we receive um, every publication produced in the UK and Ireland and have done for some centuries. Um, our collections predate the existence of the library. Um, we were formed from a number of different institutions, libraries, um, including the British Museum's library. Um, one of the main challenges that we face is the pure size of our collections. So we say we have up to 200 million collection items. Um, there's a a genteel tussle between us and the Library of Congress about which is the biggest library in the world. We're definitely one of the two biggest libraries in the world. Um, we have about 16 million books, lots of stamps, uh, manuscript volumes which are handwritten um, or archival material. Uh, we have patent collections, uh, maps, music scores. Um, we're increasingly working on um, collecting sounds because sound recordings, the physical formats are deteriorating over time. Um, we have, we record television and radio news. We um, work on the UK web archive in collaboration with other legal deposit libraries. So we collect websites from the British, um, sort of British, British internet websites. Um, and we are also sent increasingly terabytes a day of eBooks and e-journals from publishers. So publishers no longer necessarily send physical copies. Um, and I just wanted to note also that this photograph is from our Boston Spa site, which some of you may know outside of Leeds or between Leeds and York. Um, we add to our collections extensively uh, every year. This means that discoverability across collections is a challenge because there are so many different kinds of items. Um, they are all catalogued to a different extent using different formats. We work extensively with international communities on using cataloging standards but the standards for cataloging television broadcasts are different than those for um, cataloging uh, 3000 year old Chinese oracle bones. So it can be very difficult finding items across the collection. We are not a lending library, so um, we can't 
lend your items outside of the library. We have reading rooms in London and also one reading room at Boston Spa, um, not Boston Space. Um, about 4% of our collections are either digitized, so we image, um, photograph, scan, or record sound, a moving image from physical items, or they're born digital, so that's things like ebooks, social media, um, websites, um, and sound collection, music collections as well. We work closely with publishers and with readers to ensure that um, we provide legal access. And often this means that things are only available on site, which is a challenge for a library with an international readership um, and serving a national remit as well. So for the last 10 years, at least, the library has been exploring how digital access can um, broaden the number of people who can use our collections, how and when they can use the collections. We can increase the convenience of using the collections but also responding to the fact that the way that researchers work is changing. So about 10 years ago, the library's digital scholarship team was set up um, and our role is to make it easier um, to use digital collections for those mission based purposes. So research, inspiration, creativity and enjoyment. Um, there are several teams within the digital research, digital scholarship team. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the digital research team, but I would also really encourage you to look at the work of BL Labs, who do so much to enable and reward people using collections in interesting ways. Um, and also the Endangered Archives Project, which helps digitise at-risk collections around the world, making our British Library collections truly, truly international. Um, we generally work to, uh, sometimes as agents of change, you can imagine that a library has um, a lot of different departments um, and levels of experience within it. So we um, do a lot of work to invest in training for our staff support, and support scholarship. Um, the digital research team specifically is a um, cross disciplinary mix. So some people trained as librarians. Um, I trained as a computer scientist, but also as a historian um, and that kind of hybrid work that we all do means that we try and understand and support um, digital scholarship as best we can in the library. So we do a lot of training, we do a lot of collaborative projects. Um, with BL Labs, they do a lot of awards and events and competitions. Um, we try and be as chatty as we can about what we're doing um, on our blog posts and on social media. Um, we also, as you'll see with Living With Machines, publish our papers via the research repository of the British Library and where we can, we also share code, as well as providing access to data sets, sets of digitized images and files. In many ways, I describe my job as enabling the shift from reading pages to reading data sets. So the library is traditionally been very comfortable with people coming into the reading rooms. They order the books up that they want. They might have a stack of three on their desk. They go through them. Increasingly, they'll be reading physical books, but also have um, other online reference um, sources next to them on a laptop. They might even be um, other books from the British Library's collections, um, but it is a kind of process of reading through, turning a page by page. So my job is to help the library think about what it means to read data sets, to turn collections into data. And that's very much part of a wider international movement around thinking about how to make libraries more accessible, how to make, um, to dealing with the challenges of turning books, sets of images, sounds into data sets that can be analysed in different ways. One thing that we found is that collaborative projects help the um, library move more quickly. Those of you who work in large organisations know that change is hard, it's slow. Um, if you come out of this talk learning just one thing, it's that the library shown here in the um, St Pancras office um, was designed to look like a ship and of course ships are kind of notoriously slow to turn. Um, so we find that collaborations are a little bit like tugboats that um, help that ship sort of nudge it along um, and in particular we find that working with academics means that we can understand their needs better. We learn more about our collections and that benefits all readers of the library. Um, when I say readers of the library I really mean anyone who uses the collections. You don't have to be academic, you can be researching any topic you like, um, we run business support, we run lots of um, support for creative uses, artistic uses, um, teaching, learning, whatever. Um, we try and bring techniques that we learn from academic collaborations and collaborations with others 
into our own practice so that we can then teach those methods across the library and support other researchers. And we also find that it's a great way of exploring new and emerging technologies at scale. So we can do small scale pilots with our collections. We do a lot of experimentation on um, things like methods for working with sounds, methods for working with maps, um, applying machine learning technologies to automatically caption um, images or understand the content of books. But because of the size of the collections, actually scaling up and applying those technologies at an operational level um, is immensely challenging because when you're talking about 16 million books, it's a bit different than um, the kind of collection that other institutions work with. So living with machines really came out of that desire to respond to the growth that we were seeing of digital scholarship and data science methods. So we'd started teaching things like um, text and data mining, um, exploring different methods within that to understand how they might affect the library. Um, and about the same time, the Alan Turing Institute, which is um, the UK's National Institute for Data Science and Artificial Intelligence, were moving into our St Pancras building. And it seemed like the best possible way to um, take advantage of their presence to um, perhaps complicate their ideas about what data science meant by asking them to look at material from the arts and the humanities, from the history of science as well as contemporary science um, across the whole multilingual international complexity of our collections um, in terms of the countries of origin, the languages, the concepts, um, as well as the different formats in our collection. We wanted to collaborate with subject and methodological experts and I think it's really important that in this project we are using really rigorous historical and data science methods and we can only do that by collaborating with others. Um, but we also wanted to build on the library's expertise in research services and in public engagement. So we know a lot about how people use collections in the reading room through our work in digital research. We know a lot about how people use resources in teaching um, how people from non-traditional, non-computer science backgrounds might start to approach digital methods um, and the kinds of questions that uh, data scientists or computer scientists or st statisticians might have as they start to use our collections because there's a lot of um, contextual information that makes it easier. Uh, Living with Machines is also a huge opportunity to understand the potential and challenges of AI and machine learning methods for cultural organisations and we are learning a lot about um, the kinds of scale that you get when you ask data scientists to work with really, really big data that might not have the same definition of big data that they're used to. It's often very messy, it's often incomplete, um, it changes a lot over time, it's very inconsistent. Um, and even working with things like um, cloud storage bills when you're working with petabytes of data, when you unzip some of our digitized collections, and finally, the project was also an opportunity to build on the dig digitization work that's happened across the library over the past decades um, and provide sort of worked examples that will help others think about how to apply these methods, not only in giant data science projects, perhaps in smaller ways in their own um, research projects or in their teaching or their personal projects. So Living with Machines is approximately a five year project. Um, we are using it really as a case study because the long 19th century, which is really a historian's way of saying a time before and after the end of the 19th century because these um, movements are never exact. Um, if you think of the long 19th century as being the first industrial revolution, people were dealing with masses of change. Um, technology was changing ordinary lives. There were new methods of receiving information, new methods of transport, new kinds of work. It changed how time operated, it changed where people lived. Um, and we thought it was a very resonant theme at a time when new technologies um, like AI, uh, robotics, whatever, are um, changing the way that people are working now and how we're thinking about technology now. Um, so this uh, 19th century case study was a particularly sort of, it fit in the sweet spot of the kinds of questions that we wanted to explore um, and in particular also the explosion of documents from the 19th century. So the Victorian era was roughly um, coincided with the rise in new statistical methods, um, a flourishing of newspaper publishing, a flourishing of um, other sources of printing, and they're also 
um, sort of quite well collected. So there's a lot of material to work with, which of course brings its own challenges. So our aims are broadly to generate new historical perspectives. So there's a lot of work has been done on the history of the 19th century, um, but we wanted to see how we could nuance this or make it richer by using methods at scale, um, by perhaps going beyond the kinds of work that historians and others have been able to do, um, looking at page by page and how can we change their understanding by finding patterns that might be only evident when you can look at data sets rather than individual records. Um, one of our main goals is develop, to develop new computational techniques for working with historical research questions. And one of the main challenges is turning those techniques into something that um, people without necessarily a full data science background um, can access. So making these methods more accessible to the everyday historian, whether that's an academic historian or a historian working in the community as a hobby. Um, we want tools and code that other people can use, uh, reuse. We also wanted to help support the wider cultural heritage sector in using digital methods. Um, there's a lot of work happening in this at the moment. Some of you might have heard of the Towards a National Collection um, series of projects. Uh, so it's a particularly ripe moment to be doing this kinds of work. Um, we always want to increase the usage of our collections and this seemed like a really good way to do that. And finally, we wanted to be part of the public conversation about data science, about AI, um, and how the humanities and arts can have a role in those conversations. It's not just um, about maths and science and STEM. Um, these quotes kind of express the complexity of um, the different ways that stakeholders see the project, but I wanted to highlight um, Ruth's statement, she's our principal investigator, uh, about creating both a data-driven data -driven approach to our cultural past and a human focused approach to data science. And I think both of those are really fruitful and in that um, intersection of uh, creating ways for people to understand each other's disciplines, each other's ways of looking at the world, each other's ways of understanding um, valid research, uh, valid research questions, um, how results are presented. Um, that's one of the main challenges that we're taking on in this project. So really quickly, some of the benefits for the cultural heritage sector, um, providing models for really large scale research collaboration and partnership. I've spent years working in the cultural sector and have worked extensively with teams within organizations on exhibitions and digitals, digital projects. But this is a huge project for us and there's been a lot of learning in terms of how you manage that. Um, we think it's really important that people don't think of libraries as places where ideas go to die. Um, we are leading di digital innovation in some ways. There's a large piece of work around improving workflows, data processing, um, working with uh, different forms of metadata. So kind of internal processes, but really the behind the scenes stuff that makes a library work. Um, we also wanted to uh, deal with issues around copyright. So mixed rights access where some items are still copyright and others are in the public domain. How do we uh, work with expectations about open data when it's not possible for us to grant access to all forms of data? And then finally, we wanted to challenge the library slightly to think about how to incorporate digital content and data in the exhibition project or in the exhibition program. And hopefully um, we'll be seeing more of that up in Leeds at some point. Um, the team is huge. We have a large number of um, co-investigators, so kind of project management board members um, and people hired for to work on the project. So a lot of postdocs or um, research associates, um, staff at the British Library and staff um, at the Turing and people seconded from different academic institutions. Um, and this has only been possible with the support of our funders. So the UK, UKRI um, and the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, and it has been an amazing opportunity, particularly for the library, but I think also I hope for um, the rest of the team to learn together from each other about um, these different methods. So one of the first challenges we faced is how do you start a 20 something person five year project? Um, we began with some major research themes and sort of focuses of work. Um, so looking at things like biases in sources, not only the sources that we wanted to collect, but understanding 
how our source selection process and the sources available to us would shape the questions that we could ask. Thinking about how language is used in these sources, so we're working a lot with computational linguistic methods. Looking at change over space and time, which is a really important sort of historical approach. Looking at communities not only in terms of um, how the Industrial Revolution or mechanisation affected communities, however you define them in the UK, um, but also how we could engage different communities in our work. So things like crowdsourcing, um, public participation, and how we could engage academic and other research communities in our work too, and how we functioned as a, a series of communities within the project. There is a massive piece of work to integrate, manage the infrastructure, think about interfaces to these data sets. Um, we're using a lot of cloud-based services, um, but also things like Jupyter Notebooks to provide relatively lightweight entry points into some of our um, data processes. And the sheer um, process of acquiring data and wrangling it, so managing the legal rights, managing credits, um, unzipping files that can take weeks to transfer between networks. There's some really sort of um, back-end questions that are really important in our work. So some of the sources that we are looking at um, include the full text of newspapers, um, trade and postal directories. So these were sort of like the earlier versions of um, yell.com where if you wanted to look up a business, um, you'd look in a kind of, a, it would be a, a, an index or a, a printed listing of what businesses were where and um, perhaps street by street, what businesses were on each street. We want to look at working class autobiographies um, as a way of accessing a voice that isn't represented in newspapers. Um, we are looking at journals and diaries, novels, parliamentary papers, because some of the legislation gives us a sense of where different areas were being focused on. A lot of the data that we want to use is tabular and that has its own challenges. Um, looking at birth, death and marriage records, they're highly structured. If someone has already done the work of tidying them up for you, Similarly with census records, they provide a lot of access to understanding um, the life courses of people affected by the Industrial Revolution. We're doing a lot of work with computer vision on things like ordnance survey maps, um, the GOAD fire insurance maps, which give us a lot of detail about um, the composition of buildings um, and streets. And we're also looking at using Im images in publications in different ways. These are mostly collections from the British Library, but we're also negotiating access to other collections. And we're very grateful to the National Library of Scotland for providing us with their um, digitised ordnance survey maps because that's made life a lot easier. Um, and hopefully they're learning from our project as well. And we're also grateful to Find My Past for access to newspapers digitised in the British Newspaper Archive. So I wanted to spend some time thinking about how we are applying different methods um, to answer some of these sort of questions. Um, and as I said, there'll be a lot of um, terms that might go by quite quickly, but um, hopefully also some links that you can find out more. So one of the questions that we wanted to understand is, um, there are a lot of newspapers published, a lot of them were collected, uh, a percentage of them have been digitized. It's certainly nothing like the not even 20% of the collection. Um, and the selection process has been led by family historians. So the newspapers are selected to give a sort of um, geographical sample rather than necessarily being focused on the number of newspapers produced in a different region. We'll just try and get one from each region. But there were at the time these newspaper press directories published that were sort of like media buying guides. So if you wanted to know where you should advertise to reach farmers or um, big land uh, landholders or the radicals, um, you could look in these newspaper press directories and see for any given newspaper, the kind of audience that they aimed for, the tone that they had. Um, sometimes they would give uh, a sample of the kinds of topics that they'd cover. Um, so one of our researchers, Kathy Balin, is using this method to, he's comparing the um, printed directories with the newspapers digitized to understand the difference between what was available at the time and what's available digitally now. Um, and he's been applying various methods to do this work in collaboration with others. And this will really help us understand how much validity we can give to different findings. So if we say um, Leeds was leading in this, um, is it only because we haven't understood that 
um, newspapers from Manchester uh, were selected differently and focused on um, different aspects of subjects that society might be interested in. So this is really exciting work and hopefully we'll have a lot of use outside of the project. One of the main um, things that we've done that we didn't plan at the start um, is create visualizations with our research software engineer, Olivia Vane, um, to understand what's in our collections, what's been digitized, um, so that we can select certain newspapers for digitization to fill some of the gaps that we think might be there in the collection. Um, so this visualization shows it's interactive, there's a video online. Um, what we have in the collections, what's been digitized, um, it gives you a sense of the complexity of newspaper collections because um, they would change their titles. Some of them really often, um, sometimes the same title would be reused for different um, publications over time. Um, so this is a way of navigating through a really, really giant collection of newspaper titles um, to get a, a representative sense of what was being published at different times and how we can build a data set um, to be as representative as possible or to respond most closely to the kinds of research questions that we have. I mentioned our extensive use of computational linguistic methods. Um, so they're looking at questions like, um, how did people talk about machines and um, what was happening when they did talk about machines? So looking at the source text to understand the social and cultural impact of mechanization. Um, they're dealing with uh, issues like optical character recognition errors. Um, the process of automatically transcribing text with computers is not very accurate for earlier newspapers necessarily. Um, so you'll often get kind of misspelled words that can make life difficult. Um, they've been exploring methods like manual annotation to mark up the semantic um, structure of sentences under, to understand where machines were given agency. Um, and the easiest way to think about that is the stereotypical computer says no um, line from Little Britain where it's the whole point is that it's not really the computer, it's a system set up and um, enabled by the computer that's saying no to people. So they're doing really exciting work looking at geolocating mentions of places in texts so that if we can understand, um, if we can differentiate between different places, that place names that were reused, we can get a, a stronger sense of how different areas were changing through mechanization. Um, the idea of lexicon expansion is that um, we might have a term like term like machinery or machines, um, it will have some metaphorical uses. So the machinery of parliament, the machinery of God, um, but also very literal uses in factories and other industrial settings. Um, so how can we find terms that people at the time used for terms like machinery um, to run the most accurate que queries and find articles about machinery? And then they're looking through all these methods at um, how did how were machines given agency by writers over time and place so how did that change and when this is just an example of um looking for place names in text so newtown i think there are 14 new towns in the uk um so here we're looking for um uh, which new town is which based on the context of the text around the um the use of the place name but also the publication um, I mentioned the large amount of infrastructure work that's going on. They've had to do a lot of work to establish a secure environment, to setting up our compute systems. Um, they have documented and developed data models and looked at the best practice in reproducible data-driven humanities research um, and spent a lot of time supporting that. Um, I mentioned, I think, that we're using Jupyter Notebooks. We find that um, because they let you document and comment on code and the code is also executable. Um, so it helps people <clears throat> uh, run, start to access code without having to have a whole kind of setup and computing environment. Um, and they've done the initial analysis looking at uh, when we have newspapers from, how many words tended to be in an issue so that we can understand the composition of the data sets and the weighting of different findings that we might have across the project.
I mentioned that we're looking to understand change over space and time. Um, we are using maps as a way of understanding change in the industrial landscape. Um, so we've done some work um, looking at automatically transcribing text from these maps. Um, we have a blog post um, that talks about some of the results of this. So we're trying to locate places, um, but also understand how land use changed um, across time um, and trying to sort of pull out signals from these um, data sets. And it's quite um, new work, I think, to use maps as data sets in this way. Um, and we are uh, applying methods that were developed for contemporary systems to work with historical collections and thinking about how we can um, integrate annotation processes into something like human computation systems that improve the data um, analysis methods while you're working. And we're hoping that we can start to link these um, records to census records so we can understand how different industries were, um, where they were focused, where workers lived in relation to their workplaces, um, and how that changed over time. We are working with the public in lots of ways increasingly. Um, this is a crowdsourcing task set up on a platform called Zooniverse, where we have been asking people to classify accidents and then um, annotate them to help build data sets for analysis. So on the right hand side, um, it's a column of text from a newspaper, I think it might be the Hayward Advertiser, um, where one of the paragraphs is about a, um, an accident. So we did a kind of keyword search in our data set of articles to find things that might be about accidents, um, but then we needed to improve the accuracy of the data set. So having people classify these um, accidents as either being about an industrial or a workplace accident, um, a transport accident, or some other kind of accident, um, or perhaps the text might be unreadable in some way. And this has given us a data set that we can then use to um, build further tasks. The reason that we focused on accidents is because it's an obvious impact of mechanization. Um, so people who weren't used to working with machinery, um, where it's sort of hard for us to think about it now, but if you're used to um, animal driven um, machinery like carts and horses um, or manually powered machinery, the fact that a machine can't see that perhaps someone's hair or clothing is caught up in the machinery, um, trains run on tracks and take time to stop and can't swerve um, there's a lot of the kinds of things that we don't have to worry that we've learned to uh, negotiate around um, that people were still learning at the time. So there were lots of different kinds of accidents, um, as well as accidents that were perhaps caused by not understanding the benefits of health and safety or uh, not valuing the workforce perhaps as much as um, people valued productivity and keeping the machines running. So we thought talking about accidents has a direct um, resonance for our research questions, but also it's a nice way into the project. On a technical level, we're thinking about how we can integrate the results of machine learning into crowdsourcing. So we're not asking people to do more tasks than they need to, but we're improving the data set all the time behind the back end, and hopefully also finding ways to create more interesting tasks um, and improve that kind of process. And we found that this has been quite successful. So people are um, engaging with our research. So it's been such an open quest, open ended question that um, people will post and say there was a fire mentioned, does that count as an industrial accident? Um, and it's difficult because in some ways it does. Um, if a, a machine shaft sparked an accident, uh, a spark to fire that definitely does. Um, and you can also find places when fires in workplaces um, because all the machinery was centralised and work wasn't happening in individual cottages or homes, um, meant that a whole community could be out of work. But it's very much been a grey area and it's actually been um, really interesting to discuss that with participants and um, learn from their perspectives as well. Um, and I just have to include these comments because there is something amazing about the goriness of the process. Um, certainly makes you appreciate the fact that office work might feel a bit boring at times, but it's certainly a lot safer than working with 
um, early industrial machinery. So as an example of how we want to use these methods to work across the project um, with all these different strands and integrating the work of these different strands, um, we think the classified articles could be used as the basis of machine learning and those lexicon expansion methods to find more relevant articles. Um, we also want to test whether we've got a list of names of people involved in accidents with um, any uh, place names, um, organization names and details of their, like it sometimes mentions their age or their address, um, to see whether we can work with the public, particularly family and community historians who are very expert in finding people in data sets to understand the longer term of um, these accidents on individuals, their families and communities. So questions like, um, does the person's family move not long after an accident? Are they still economically active? Are they in the poor house? Um, trying to understand how the, these changes in mechanization actually did literally affect individual lives. Um, but then also more broadly opening out again to look at how language around accidents changed over time. So I've discovered that um, boiler explosions were immensely powerful and could um, injure people working in a field across from the factory, could injure people passing by in the street outside. Um, so what was it like to be drip fed this um, language about how dangerous some of this machinery could be, as well as language about how exciting machinery could be, how it would make Britain uh, more competitive with France and textile industries, for example. Um, so we want to look at those kinds of questions as well. And broadly, we want to organise talks and edit-a-thons um, for the moment, mostly online, um, but we hope also in local libraries, um, working with the Living Knowledge Network, which is um, the British Library working with local authority libraries around the country, and that's a really exciting opportunity for us. Um, and we want to get out there and bring data science into tiny branch libraries. Um, so coming to the end, I just wanted to share, these are some sample recent blog posts to give you a sense of how varied um, the subjects that we're talking about are, um, whether your interest is in the history or in the um, code or in the library processes, we hope that there'd be something for everyone in this. Um, and we'd really, really appreciate questions because particularly not being able to run public events, it's difficult to know what people are interested in and how we can best help them understand um, the potential of this project for their own work as well. So we have research papers and data sets available on the British Library's research repository. Um, if you search for living with machines or the name of an individual um, researcher, you'll find some results there. We are increasingly making code publicly available on GitHub um, and trying to do that in, um, at the same time as making data sets available to work with so you can combine the two. Uh, we have a mailing list which is very low traffic and just kind of points to um, the latest news. Um, our website is where our blog is. If you have any questions please contact us at digitalresearch at bl.uk and we're on Twitter as well and this week we'll be taking part in the Day of DH which is a Day of Digital Humanities where we talk about um, the kinds of work that we do because our work is very much at the intersection of data science, history and digital humanities. So we're trying to reach all those communities. So at that point I will stop um, and see what questions we might have coming in from Ken. Thank you all for listening.